Have you ever had a, a few days where you said, man, this, this is not going well? Or maybe not just a few days, but a f- few weeks where you think it's, it's not going well. There was a, a, a young gal uh, who grew up in our church when it was at the movies theater. This past week, uh, she lives in Temecula now. She's married to a, a Marine. And, well, let me just uh, see if I have... This is her picture. Some of you know her as Autumn Carl when Autumn lived in Rosamond and they came to worship with us. And uh, so she's had, she's had some storms this past week. Some small ones, but they could have gotten larger. This is uh, Autumn with her husband. They have two daughters and, and a little guy. The little guy is going to be going to kindergarten this fall. And, and he has Down syndrome. And she just, they just, uh, it's amazing just to watch them share and to love on their kids and to love on one another. Here's a Marine, and when he posts on the, the website, he's always saying something about how he loves his wife and, and how terrific she is. And I'm thinking, wow, the rest of the men of the world need to, to take note from that kind of a guy. Anyway, they, they were going to remodel their house. She got busy and, and was painting all the rooms. They're just working away. She finishes the last room. It happened to be their son's room. His name is Tyler. And you think of a four-year-old that's soon going to be five and soon going to be in kindergarten with Down syndrome. And she's painted all the rooms in the house and everything is finally got to his room. It's the last room, beige on top over the blue on the bottom with a beautiful white chair rail separating the two colors. She slips away, and not even for 10 minutes, and her little guy comes in <laughs> and says, Mommy painted? I ought to just jump right in there too. She comes back in the room and goes, Oh my goodness! But of course, when a little guy does this, you know, uh, she'd also taken and painted his name on a, a little post right in the doorway coming into his room. So he thought he'd help her with that too. <laughs> she said, it only took me an hour to, to get these letters down there. And then he's there painting. Of course, when you get a little four-year-old that's into the paint, it not only gets on the walls, right? Because it, it gets on their nice beige carpet. But... Fortunately, they're remodeling their house and they're going to replace the carpet anyway. But I just thought, oh, blue on beige. Isn't that what mom did, you know? <laughs> the beige on the top, so blue on beige. And, and she's just about ready to pull her hair out. Actually, what happened along the way, she, she started posting some of these pictures. One of our people saw it and, and I said, well, and when my wife saw it, I said, Hey, send Autumn a note and say, Autumn, can I share that with the congregation on Sunday? Sometimes when everything's going fine and and you've finished everything, and then you start all over again. But that wasn't even the worst part of it. Because along the way, they got the new carpet in. And the, the men that installed the carpet... You know, slid everything back in place. That night, their little guy, Tyler, came into their bedroom to sleep. And while he was in the bedroom with them, the bed had been pushed up against the lampstand. And the, the mattress caught on fire. And of course, by the time the alarm went off, it it went off pretty quickly. But they were so grateful that the little guy wasn't in his bed because it ended up looking like this and it had burned into the wall where the electrical outlet was. And of course, their brand new carpet, another fun time to replace. Just when you think, what else could go wrong? 
Audrey wrote her and said, hey, can, can my husband share some of those things? I mean, every one of us have difficulties in life. Let's call them storms. Every one of us face storms in our lives. This just happened to be one this past week with her. Audrey said to her, hey, can my hubby use this? Here's her response back. Audrey, this is great. I was just talking to my husband, trying to digest the last couple of days. And I reminded him that God has a plan for everything and can turn ashes into beauty. Please feel free to use anything you need. If God can use it to work in someone else's life, then what a blessing. What a, isn't that amazing? That's encouraging. But she goes on from there, and she says, God definitely had his hand on us, because if anything had been done differently, it could have been devastating. We are already laughing about it. When push comes to shove, it's just stuff. I'm so happy it's working for God's glory. Isn't that just the way you want it to be? And again, let's just go back. Every one of us, all of us have storms in our lives. And when you look at, at Acts 27, it gives us some lessons that we can learn how to handle storms. There are a lot of them in here, and I, we're not going to cover the whole chapter. But we've been going through the book of Acts, and we wanted to just continue. We wanted you to know that we're just systematically wanting to teach through God's Word. And even on these days, God has messages for everybody that applies from where we're studying God's Word. The first lesson I want you to get when you're in a storm of life is this. Realize that some people might not take your advice in the storms of life. In Acts chapter 27, let's start at verse 7. Paul and the others are on a ship. There are 276 people on this ship. If you were to calculate something that would hold that many people, it would have to be at least 140 to 150 feet long. And if the calculations are correct between how long something has to be that way and how wide, it would be 36 to 40 feet wide to hold 276 people. Paul is on his way to Rome. He's a prisoner on this ship with some other prisoners. And they're struggling to try to get there. And there's a storm, and it's been difficult. And so the text says this, verse 7, We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens, near the town of Lassie. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast, which means it would have been late September or October, and it's starting in the cold season and the, the stormy season, and it's going to be rough at sea, the Mediterranean. So Paul warned them. Highlight that in your thinking. Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. And great loss of ship and cargo. And to our lives also. But the centurion, the guy that was in charge of Paul's life, but the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. They're in a storm. Paul gives what appears to be good advice. And what did they do? They said, wait a minute. Are you in charge? Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. You're the prisoner. Get on where you belong. They didn't listen to his advice. They got into problems. I'm wondering how many of you could be honest enough as adults to say, you know, my parents used to tell me some stuff and I didn't take their advice. And I suffered some of the consequences. 
You know, I don't know how many weddings I performed, and I, I, I was licensed into the ministry in June 1970. So for, this will be 42 years coming up on this June. I don't know how many weddings I performed. But many times when I met with the couples, and you're, you're doing premarital counseling, sometimes you meet with them and you go, oh man, this is great. This couple is terrific. And sometimes you go, oh my goodness, what do your parents say? <laughs> I figure if I have some reservations, their parents probably have some reservations too. <clears throat> but the difficulty is when I get into some older people, you know, that uh, they're out of home. They're, they're not just 18, 19, 20, still living at home. They're, they're starting to be on their own. I remember one such couple, I brought him in, went through the, the premarital counseling stuff. We even gave him some things to, to take so we could know their, you know, their personalities and how they work with one another and stuff. I put the two pieces of paper together, and it was disastrous. So when I met with them, I handed it to them, and I said, I said to her, is this what you're like? Yep. It was not a good picture. And I said, and they described her based on what she had said. I said, is this what you're like? She said, yep. I said to him, do you understand that this is what she's like? I mean, that's pretty bold, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm get wading in and getting into difficulty. I said, do you, do you understand what, that she's like this? Uh, yeah. I said, okay. I don't want you coming back to me in a year from now and saying, I didn't know. I, I, I said, you know something? If you, if this is what you want, and she, she was good with it, he was good with it. I didn't marry him, but they got married. And a year later, the guy came back to me and he said, I should have listened to you. And they ended up divorced. Sometimes, when the Apostle Paul, or sometimes as you as parents, you see your kids in a storm, you see a storm all around their lives and you try to give them guidance and in the midst of the storm you say, I think you need to go this way or I think let's just put the boat in the dock right now. Let's just get your life stable and watch some of the responses that take place during that storm. What happens during the storm? Instead of listening... They followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. And the owner of the ship said, we need to get all this cargo, all this wheat. We need to get it all the way up over to Italy. And I don't get any money until that happens. Let's go. But again, when you look at it in Acts 27, 21, just 10 verses later, it says this. After the men had gone for a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Isn't that just what you want somebody to say to you when things have gone wrong? Well, I told you. Do you like to hear that from your wife? Do you like to hear that from your parents? But sometimes they need to say it. Just to remind you, look, you were warned. God gave you direction. And you still chose to go the wrong way. Look, let me say it again. We all face storms. Okay, let me give you the, uh, remind you that Luke, Luke wrote this, this book. And he gives us all the details of what's going on here. What Paul said, what the people responded, how they started to throw things overboard, all the details. Look at the second lesson. First one, realize some people might not take your advice. Secondly, remember the majority isn't always right. And can I say that to some of the young people here today? Oh, when everybody, well, everybody does it. And what do you, is, what, is the parent, what did your parents say to you? Yeah, I suppose if everybody jumped off the cliff, you'd do it too, huh? You know, you've heard that statement. You probably said that statement if you've had kids that are teenagers at some point. You're trying to tell them just because everybody does it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. 
Look at what the text says. Starting at verse 9 again, Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. And that's not Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> that might be a nice place to winter in, but not for them in the Mediterranean. Who decided? The majority. Let me uh, take you to the Old Testament passage that might illustrate this a little bit. Joseph, starting in Genesis chapter 37. Remember, he had this dream and all his brothers were someday going to really honor him and be submissive to him. And they got upset with him. They were sent away to take care of the sheep. And Joseph's father said, go check on them, see how they're doing. When he gets near them, all of them start to talk. Hey, let's kill him. You know your family is really a problem family when you want to kill your brother. And so here's what the text says in Genesis 37, starting at verse 20. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll, then we'll see what com comes of his dreams. He had dreamed that they were all going to follow him, and, and they did in Egypt later on. But then we'll see what happens to him. Verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue Joseph from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Verse 22, don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. The majority wanted to do him in. One guy said no. By the time you go to chapter 42, here's what it says in verse 22. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. It almost sounds like the ship situation, doesn't it? I told you, didn't I? You refused to listen, didn't you? Because the majority is not always right. Joshua had the same uh, situation. Remember, he and Caleb went into the land they were going to examine the land. They spied out the land with all the others. Twelve of them went and spied out the land. Here's what the text says in Joshua chapter 14, verses 7 and 8. Now Joshua's in charge, and Caleb is with him, and Caleb comes to him and he says this, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear because the majority was wrong. God said, go in, go in, go in. I want you to understand, I don't know what storm you're facing. I know what storm some of you are facing right now, but I don't know what storm all of you are facing. But what I can tell you is all of us face storms and we'll get lessons to learn out of this passage in, in Acts 27. And the first one when I looked at it was realized... They're not going to take your advice at times. Secondly, remember the majority isn't always right. So stand up for God. Face the storm. God's going to go with you through the storm. Let me give you a third reason. Be cautious. A third lesson. Be cautious when you think you have smooth sailing ahead. You already know that's a mistake, right? I mean, it's not going to be as smooth as you think. Here's the text, Acts 27, 13. When a gentle south wind, wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. You can always find a south wind blowing if you look long enough. 
You can always find a reason. You know, I'm sure God wanted me to marry this person. I'm sure God wanted me to move here. I'm sure God... And God gets blamed for a lot of things. Paul had already warned them. But as soon as a gentle south breeze began to blow, they go... Da, 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 da. You know, they're wanting to sail off and just have a great time. Verses 14, 15 of chapter 27. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster, or sometimes we call it a, a nor'easter. Actually, the Greek word, right out of the Greek and English, is a typhoon. They're in the midst of a typhoon. Remember that gentle south breeze? It's kind of like, the, you know, when you think you're going God's way and you're not. A nor'easter, a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. Man, here's where we started in, in the movie's West Theater. April 19th, 1987. Today it's that beauty shop, uh, beauty school on 2733 West Avenue L. You know what we did? We thought, oh, we couldn't even find a place. Nobody, wanted to, nobody wants to rent to a church. And it was Audrey and Laura Cox who went in and, and asked the guy if we could do the movie theater. And he said yes. So we, we didn't really have much. We had to buy cribs. We had to buy carpeting to put down on the floor because we didn't want the babies on the floor that was there. You ever been to a movie theater? Yeah. And so we had to buy these things and, and we didn't really have, we didn't have speakers yet. We had a big amp and that kind of stuff, but we didn't have the speakers. We had a mixing board, couldn't afford the speakers. You ever been to a movie theater? Right behind, you, you know that monster screen that's right there? It's just, if you stand behind that, that monster white screen, there's just thousands of pinholes. Because all their speakers are right behind the screen. About a dozen of them. And they're these big ones. Monsters. All mounted there together. Our sound guy says, you know something? We have the amp. We have the mixing board. We don't have any speakers. You know, I'll just take our amp and I'll just click it to their speaker wires and it's exactly what we can use. And you should have heard the sound that day. <laughs> you know, when I tried to sing, they could not, you know. I was, I was scraping the Milky Way, you know. They could not. <laughs> and by the, the instruments, everything's going, just pounding through that. We leave there that day. We had that gentle south breeze just kind of flowing. Man, we're, oh man, that's a fantastic day. We're all in the clouds because it's, it's really wonderful. We get a call from the movie theater that night. Guy says, we can't get any sound in our, in our theater number such and such. Did you guys do anything? I go, of hurricane force. <laughs> a nor'easter. I said to him, you know, I don't know what you're losing in money tonight, but I said, whatever you lose in money, we will pay for and we'll, we'll be over to, I'll have our sound guy tell you what, what he did. And you know what really happened? All the power from our amp, instead of just going up into the speakers, it, they went up into the speakers, but they were tapped to their wires. So it ran up into the speaker, and it ran up into their projector up in the sound booth, and blew one of the diodes up there because the power was going both directions. I just want you to see, you know, when things look like they're going to go well, sometimes a typhoon is on the way. And sometimes that's why God says, be still and 
know that I am God. Just when you think you have the right direction, all of us have storms. What are the lessons? Not everybody's going to take your advice. The majority isn't always right. Third, be cautious. When you think you have smooth sailing ahead, it's never going to be completely smooth. Storms come from one of probably three areas. Sometimes you cause them. Jonah caused it on the ship, right? If he hadn't been in sin, the storm wouldn't have been there. The storm was designed for him, so they'd throw him overboard. Matter of fact, it says in the text, throw me overboard, I'm the reason you're facing this. Another reason storms come in your life, God allows them at times. He designs them so you can grow. Matthew uh, chapter 14, remember? He sent the disciples out in the sea, he let them get into the storm, and then he came walking to them on the water. So that they go, wow, he can do that? Peter says, let me come out. So sometimes God causes some of the storms in your life not to hurt you, but so that you can see him display his power. And he invites you to watch and walk on that water too in some special ways. So sometimes you cause your own storm. Sometimes God causes the storm. Sometimes other people, you're on the ship with Jonah. And he caused the storm and you're stuck. You're on board with him. Be cautious when you think you have smooth sailing ahead because storms can come from many areas. Fourthly, understand that storms can cause some people to lose all hope. Look at this. Acts 27, 18. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw, we, they began to throw the cargo overboard. You've seen that. Hey, I'll just start throwing everything every which way. I don't know. We, we got to get rid of it. We got to do this. You're just throwing everything out. The text goes on. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Who are we talking about here? Paul was on the ship. Aristarchus was on the ship from Thessalonica. Luke was on the ship. He's writing it. What did he say? We finally gave up all hope. Maybe that's where you are today. The storm has just got you beaten down and you're about ready to give up all hope. I would just say to you, it's, it's too soon. It's, it's too soon to give up all hope. We all have storms in life. And there are lessons to learn. The first lesson, not everybody's going to take your advice. Remember, the majority isn't always right. Be cautious when you think you have smooth sailing ahead. Understand that storms can cause some to lose all hope. Let me give you the last lesson I want to give you today is this. Recognize that God gives us others to be with us in the storms. He doesn't send you into the storm all alone. You know how that happened for us? I was pastoring in uh, Michigan City, Indiana. God was calling us to come out and plant a church. On the Sunday that I was going to resign that church and to go out and plant what is today, Faith Community Church. I stood up in the pulpit. Yeah, they had a pulpit. Okay. I stood up in the pulpit. I looked down. We had the invitation. I actually gave an invitation and people came forward and there were people down in the front. And I looked down and I thought, oh God, you're still using me here. And I looked at the resignation and I looked at the people there and I thought, okay, Lord, I'm not going to doubt right now in this emotional moment what you have clearly shown us we should do. 
I'm glad you're using us still here. But I almost, I almost thought, do, do, do I just tear this resignation up and just stay right here? I said, okay, God, I'm just going to trust you. This is how you've led. I started, to tr- I started to try to read the resignation. You know, I just was, you know, blubbering and teary and, and people were crying. And Some guy came up out of the audience. He tries to, to keep things going. He starts crying. Once it was all over, I said, man, I never want to do this again. That's why I'm here 25 years now. <laughs> I never want to face that again. A couple came up out of the audience at the end of the service. People are crying everywhere. This couple comes up, they're excited. I thought, oh, they're glad I'm going. (laughs) They, They had been praying just earlier with several other people. They had come forward earlier and their prayer was, Lord... They hadn't told anybody. Lord, we're going to lay this before you. Do you want us to go to California and and move our family there? And there was a job opportunity they were looking at being involved with. And that couple was Brian and Laura Cox, who I showed you the picture 25 years ago for 25 years. But here's what I want you to understand. The invitation's there. They are praying. I'm in confusion almost. Here's my resignation. Here God's working. I almost misread it. But it was God's way of preparing them. They didn't know I was resigning. I didn't know they were laying that before the Lord. They walked back to their seats. We announced that we're going to California to start a church They look at each other and go, is this what God wants? Is this the answer, right? You know, we we just prayed it and boom, this is the answer? And within just 60 days, we were all out here, all out here in California. And God used them. Why? Because you recognize that God gives us some others to be with us in the storms. Let me show you how that works in Acts 27. Here's Acts 27, 1 to 20. We've been working our way through some of those verses. How they wouldn't listen and all those kind of things. But look at what you see in this text. We would sail. We boarded a ship. We did this. They were with us. We moved. We did this. We did this. What do you see there? This is the fourth section, the fourth we section in the book of Acts. Who wrote the book? Luke did. He wrote the gospel according to Luke as well. Aristarchus was there who later was said to be a slave of Paul and a servant for the Lord. Paul wasn't on that ship alone. And as they went to the next port, you know what the centurion did? The centurion, who was in charge of them, said, oh, hey, Paul, we just put into dock here a little bit. I know you have some friends in this town. Why don't you go see them and let them feed you and stuff? Wait a minute. He's a prisoner. When's the last time you say, oh, you know, just check back in with me, you know. Make sure you're back when the boat gets ready to leave. He has people in that storm that are helping him. I want you to understand, that's why God put together a church. Because we're a body. And when one part suffers, we all what? Suffer. And when one part rejoices, what do we do? We rejoice. And that's the way it should be. Clark Little. You know this guy? Raise your hand if anybody knows him. Nobody. Okay. Here's what he does. He's taking pictures inside the barrel of those 
big waves. Look at some of the pictures he's done. Look at the sun as it, the water is so thin coming across the top of there that you can see the sun penetrating that. Or look at this one. This is the sand is being sucked up just before it's going to just throw him everywhere. How do we get these kind of waves? Because there are storms out at sea. And they keep crashing in and they kind of make their way in. I don't like the waves when I'm out in a, a ship and 10, 12 foot, 14 foot waves and you're going up and down and you're going, I don't feel so well. But he chooses to go right in the midst of them and he says what he has to do is just as they're crashing, he has to actually throw himself right into like the sand here and then hold his breath until he can come up. He's got a camera that takes nine frames a second and he just holds it there and he's right in the midst and he's and then he's under. You know how it happened? His wife wanted a picture in their living room. He says, I can get a picture for you. She wanted one with something like this. He took a little camera out, started doing it. Then he got, so he did this. Look at this one. Look at the sand as it sucked up. Here's what I want you to see. Storms can create some beautiful pictures. And that's what God wants to do in your life and mine. He wants you to come out the other side and you have some unbelievable testimony to share what God has done in the midst of the storms. If your God isn't any good in the storm, why would somebody else want to trust him? But when the storm comes and they see God's faithfulness, they go, that's the kind of God I want. When I think of this message, the question I have for you is this. Are you willing to trust the Lord in your storms of life? Or are you going to throw everything overboard? Or are you going to listen to everybody else's advice and not God's or not godly people? I want to challenge you to run to godly people. And can I even say it this way? Listen to me. Even if your parent is unsaved, God can use them to give you good advice. I would challenge you to listen to your parents and honor them, which is what God's Word says. And then I would challenge you to get with godly people for counsel. Because you might not be in a storm right now, but one's coming. You might be in the south wind, that gentle south breeze just blowing right now, but a storm's coming. And you need to be able to handle it. Would you join me in praying together? Heavenly Father, I join your body of believers right here. I'm praying with them that you'll help us weather whatever storms are ahead for us as individuals and for uh, your church here. Father, we're praying that your spirit would speak to our hearts. While your heads are bowed, while your eyes are closed, can I speak to you while you're, you're waiting on God right now? Would you trust God with your storm? Can you say, Lord, I want to come. I want to give it to you. I want to give my life to you. I want a God who can handle storms. Would you pray this prayer? Oh, Lord Jesus, I I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Lord Jesus, I want to ask you to come. I want to ask you to come and live in my life. 
be my savior today. If you prayed that prayer, we rejoice with you. Many of you prayed that through the years. Can I challenge you today to say, Dear God, ready me. Ready me for the next storm. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.